from the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. these windows, we think to ourselves how beautiful it is to look at the clean, beautiful San Francisco Bay, but it wasn't always the case. It turns out that for the first century, we kept polluting this bay and other bays all around the world. And our speaker today knows a little bit about that. Born in Chicago, he remembers being a little four-year-old and watching on television, four and five, you know, sea hunk, and he loved seeing these <laughs> scuba divers. Uh, play around with octopuses and under sea life, and uh, he got kind of a taste for it. And by the uh, time he and his brother earned some money in their paper route, they bought a 12 foot plastic sailboat and they started sailing around in Lake Erie. Diego, I'm not sure if this is totally working. And so um, he kept messing about in the water until in 73 when he became a certified scuba diver. And uh, after graduating in uh, getting a degree in mechanical engineering, became a designer of mechanical uh, medical instruments. And as a designer of those instruments, he kept constantly thinking about how he could use his technology. So he designed underwater camera mounts and started um, doing more scuba diving and shooting underwater fish and sea life. And in uh, 82, he recognized the amount of uh, uh, sea life was diminishing, and specifically the amount of kelp was diminishing. He moved to Huntington Beach in 79 in Southern California, where he could be near scuba diving and uh, professionally, you know, he could work in Huntington Beach. But he began thinking, well, if kelp is disappearing, this is not a good thing. This is a bad thing. So in the year 2000, he founded Ocean Defenders. Their goal is to find and remove junk from the ocean. And so lots of people are exclaiming about what a problem it is to have junk in the oceans, but they're actually doing something about it. They literally, physically, they use their volunteer force to remove junk from our oceans. And so I want to welcome... Oh yeah, I can uh, hear and it doesn't sound too loud. That, that sounds good. All right, well... I, I definitely am honored to be here. Um, who hasn't wanted to come here and watch this <laughs> great scenery here and to be invited to this long-established sailing club means a lot to me. Uh, I, I really mean that. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about, more about myself and then I'll get into uh, what we do. Um, in 67, my family was living in Ohio, uh, in Cleveland, and um, the Cuyahoga River ran right through town. Cuyahoga River is the one that uh, was receiving all the deposits of our effluent from um, the industrial age. Uh, this is where all the toxins, paints, uh, refuge from the uh, gas and steel mills was going, and we just put it into the water. That's how we got rid of the stuff. Well, you can imagine, it was not a pretty sight. And my house was right on Lake Erie, uh, nine miles away from Cuyahoga River, where that dumped in. And I was swimming in this stuff every day because uh, I was, I've always been a water body and I wanted to get in there and swim with them. And I was swimming in amongst dead and dying fish. And I, you know, I was 14 years old going home crying because what's going on with all these fish? It was just insane. And uh, 67, the Cuyahoga River caught on fire, burned for three straight days, they put it out. And that's what the water looked like. Oh. This wasn't an oil spill. That was how the Cuyahoga River actually was, uh, oh. we were treating it. Oh. And uh, the, the, the only good thing that came out of that is uh, we started the uh, Clean Water Act in, in 71. But at the same time while that was going on, I was going in my living room watching these great Jacques Cousteau documentaries. And I'm going, what? What the heck's going on here? Why is it so different between what I'm seeing on TV and what uh, you know I see in the reality? So I knew at, at that early age that um, I was not bound for Cleveland for very long. I have always been fascinated by fish, and I wanted to get out to where I could uh, see this stuff. So I had read about and seen all this great footage of uh, California's kelp beds. 
and wanted to get out there. So I moved out to, um, to uh, Huntington Beach in 79, and immediately, I had already had my certification, but I immediately started diving into kelp beds. And it was fantastic. It was just, it was another world. Like, if people say they're the redwoods of the oceans, and they are, uh, it was fantastic. Um, so I started looking into what, what was going on. In 1982, we had a big El Nino come through into California, it killed off 90% of the kelp. And with all that kelp going, um, uh, we were losing uh, all kinds of fish. In a healthy kelp forest, you'll see roughly a thousand different species of animals that thrive in there. And one of the animals is, is these guys, the otters. But we had, with the disappearance of the kelp, we had, uh, I found out that we had killed off most of the otters to the point where they were uh, extinct. They, were, uh, they thought they were extinct until they found that little group of them in the central California. There were about 50 of them they found. I believe that was in the 30s. So they slowly started rebounding, and uh, what I found out is that they are keystone species, and they're one of the reasons we have healthy kelp forests, or where they are, where we're allowing them to be, we have healthy kelp forests. One of the animals they go after, the otters eat uh, plentifully, are abalone, and we love abalone to eat. Unfortunately, this is what Happened. This is 1930s, I think it was, Santa Barbara. There were hundreds of these family-run uh, operations up and down the coast, and we just wiped them all out. There are seven different species of abalone, all commercially extinct now. There's small remnant populations here and there, but uh, effectively they're extinct. Let's hope we, uh, now that there's a moratorium on killing them, let's hope that uh, they come back. Uh, one of the pro issues with uh, the otters being gone is the urchins will eat the holdfast of the kelp. This is the holdfast is the root system basically of the kelp, and that's what it attaches itself to the substrate with. And of course, the plant can thrive there. But where the otters are gone, uh, they don't feed on the urchins, and now the urchins are decimating the kelp forest. Again, we're having a loss of a huge loss of kelp forest. And you end up with these urchin barrens, where that's basically all you see are, are urchins. And with no predators or very few predators left, it's a huge problem. Again, there's roughly a thousand different animals that will uh, thrive in a healthy kelp forest. So that's what it looks like when that uh, hold fast gets cut away and, and the thing, the kelp starts floating away. So I started looking into what are the predators of the urchins, and this is one of them. The sheep's head, they get to be about three feet bit, uh, long, maybe about 35 pounds, and they will eat the urchins. So we need to leave those guys alone. Uh, the other animal that can eat uh, the urchins that I found out are lobsters. Here, this was in 1999, I came across a, uh, a, a, an abandoned lobster trap with uh, some lobster stuck in it, and I wanted to free the lobsters. I've been a vegetarian for a long time, so I don't eat them. And um, when the divers saw me trying to do that, they came over and helped out. And when we got to back to the boat, everybody was talking about it. They were like, "Where's the butter? You, you know, you didn't, you didn't keep those guys. What are you, some nuts?" But I thought, okay, well, there's, maybe there's something I can do about it. So it, in 2000, I was volunteering with Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. I volunteered with them for 19 years. I uh, asked them if they could donate a boat to me, and they donated this boat to me. I put the world's uh, most sublime paint job on it. I wanted to make sure nobody recognized what I was doing. And uh, we had a great time with that boat. We called it the Garibaldi, but uh, we really should have called it the boat who wouldn't float because that thing wanted to go down all the time. Uh, this, this is uh, 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 Laguna Beach, the kelp beds there. And um, that line you saw there is what happens when sorry about that noise factor there uh that line is what did i turn it off no no oh, you can hear it okay uh that line is attached to a, a, a trap and that line goes to the surface and that's what these whales get entangled in so that line is vertical in the water 24 hours a day for 
basically six months. The lobster season runs from uh, October through March down in, in Southern California. Uh, the, the gray whales come up and down the coast all the time, uh, twice a year. And this was one that was in uh, 20 feet of water in Laguna Beach. And it just shows you how close they come. How This is their territory. We're going into their habitat. And uh, when I saw that line in there, I knew that I wanted to do something about it. So we got, uh, because it was so close to shore, we could take that boat out uh, to the coast of uh, Laguna Beach and, and remove those lines. We were removing thousands of feet of line every time we went out because nobody had ever done this before. So these lines are all over the place. That's what a line looks like when it gets uh, tangled up on a, a, a whale. And you can see it's cutting right into her dorsal fin there, and uh, or a pectoral fin, I'm sorry, and cutting into it. And you know, even though these animals don't always die, but indeed they do die because of that weight that the uh, trap is on it, it's a lot of weight. Uh, but sometimes they, uh, the, the uh, trap gets cut loose and they swim away with it, but it still injures them. And, it, and it, to the point of uh, when the uh, right whales are entangled, 80% of them, 80% never reproduce again because of the stress they go through. Oh so these, these traps are really problematic. Here's uh, Noah started keeping track of these. Sorry about that. I forgot <laughs> to cut the sound on that. Um, I don't know how to turn the sound off here. You're going to have to put up with this for a moment. Okay. Uh, well done. Okay. There you go. Thanks, there you go. Diego. Um, moving on, uh, this moves fast here. Um, in 2007, uh, Sea Shepherd donated another boat to me. Uh, this one was a, an ex Coast Guard rescue vessel. So it was made out of aluminum, it was a lot stronger, a lot more durable. We could go further away uh, than I could with that other boat. So uh, I had heard about a, a squid boat that had gone down with uh, about 20,000 pounds of net on it. This was off of uh, um, Avalon, uh, Catalina Island. It was uh, south of there. And this was in about 150 feet of water very beyond the safe diving limits for uh, recreational divers. So I had to get a hold of uh, some technical divers that would go down. And we worked on that site for about two years. Again, the, the net, we estimate the net weight, uh, 20,000 pounds. We could not get it up off of there in one, one piece. So we had to go down several times, start cutting it and roll it up and then get it out uh, as much as we could. And these nets are made out of nylon. And the mesh on it is about half an inch. So almost nothing gets through that net. And as that net is down there, and trust me, that net's gonna be down there a long time, about 650 years, um, that net co collects all kinds of animals, crabs, and then shrimps come in and feed on it. And then of course the sea lions and sharks and other animals come to feed on those guys. So it's really a, a death trap that uh, keeps on going. Uh, this was kind of the year that uh, made a difference in, in my organization's uh, higher or uh, legacy. The LA Times covered this story, and all of a sudden, everybody throughout the world had heard about Ocean Defenders. Up until then, we were just my buddies and me, you know, working in my backyard, basically. Uh, but that was a, a monumental change for us. And um, I, I had, I won't say become friends with, but I knew Bob Barker uh, through uh, other um, uh, uh, campaigns I had been on with Sea Shepherd. And when he heard about what we were doing, he donated enough money for us to buy this uh, large boat, which we use to today. It's a 55 foot um, uh, Chris Craft. Uh, and we can now get people on the bow, we can put the traps on the bow and have the divers in the back so people aren't gonna get uh, hit and, and impaled by these traps as we get them up out of the water. This is Laguna Beach uh, of around an MPA, um, a marine protected area. The, the fishermen can't fish there in these MPAs, obviously. So what they do is they lay their traps right on the border to the MPA. And that's what you end up with is just a string of traps there. 
And, you know, it, it kind of looks benign when you're seeing it from the surface. So I, I went down with our divers and we filmed it. This is what it looks like underwater. And you have that, each trap has a vertical line going to the surface. And of course that's potential for whale entanglements. And uh, also the boats come through there, uh, recreational boats come through there and they're constantly cutting the lines. And so you end up with these abandoned traps down there and that trap looked like it had been down there for, I don't know, two years or something. And it was still catching animals. So it, even though the trap might look like it's benign, we want to get those things out of there for two reasons, obviously, to stop trapping animals, but also to prevent that thing from washing around. When storms come in and they wash those, those traps around, and trust me, they move hundreds of feet. There even been uh, documented evidence of them washing or miles away, hundreds of feet, uh, you know, sometimes miles away. So it's scouring the bottom. It's just tearing up the bottom, and we want to prevent that. Um, the uh, Orange County Register covered a story of, about you know what, what we're doing, and uh, it was not well received by the fishing community. So there was a lot of antagonism about what we were doing uh, within their their waters. You know, it's like it's not ours, but uh, they own it. So uh, that's a challenge that I face to this day is working with the uh, fishing community, um, getting to them to recognize that they don't own these things, that it's a public resource. One of the other things as I've, you know, started the organization, I didn't realize that all this plastic was becoming so ubiquitous in our life. Again, I started in 2000. Well, now everything is washing into the oceans. Uh, you, you've got all these uh, culverts and uh, rivers that uh, bring all that, all that plastic from the land down to the ocean. And we just wanted to do what we can to clean that up. So we go out into the harbors during the big rains. We don't go out all the time, but when the big rains come, we'll go out into the harbors and uh, with our boats and, and try to get this stuff out of there. These are some of the birds that are affected by it. That's a uh, long-billed curlew. And um, what's nice about doing this when we can uh, on, on the docks is that we can get the kids involved. Usually, I, well, not usually, I cannot get kids on my boat because of the uh, legal ramifications. But on these beach cleanups, we can get the young people involved. And they're the ones that are going to inherit this mess. So it's really important for me uh, as the leader of this organization to get the young people excited and involved. And we've been doing that. It's been great. Um, here's a, a place called the Seal Beach National Wildlife Refuge. It's in, uh, near Huntington Beach. And we've removed, on average, every time we clean this place up, probably 600 pounds oh. of plastics. And you guys know... It takes a lot of plastic to make up 600 pounds, but that's how much is there. And you can come back month after month, and it's it's back to where it was, you know, as as it was before you left from or excuse me from the last time you came there. So we get a lot of uh, uh, gravity out of that because we get so many different generations of people involved in doing that. Uh, so that's enough about California. I'll go to now talk about uh, the next phase of ODA. Uh, I was invited in 2016 to talk to the law school at uh, University of Hawaii, and I didn't know why they wanted me to come there, but heck, I'll go to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I found out with, before the, my talk was over, we had started a chapter in Hawaii. <laughs> no intention of doing that, but that's how it, it came about. And uh, it, it's been a fantastic ride. Now, I'll, I'll give a little bit of a PSA here to, to let you know more uh, in detail about what we do, what goes on in Hawaii. And this lasts for about five minutes, and then uh, I'll, I'll start talking again. Aloha. My name is Kurt Lieber, and I'm the president and founder of Ocean Defenders Alliance. This is a short video about how plastic fishing lines can create havoc for some of Hawaii's iconic marine mammals, turtles, corals, and fish. You probably love Hawaii's rich diversity of marine life as much as I do. 30% of the fish found here are endemic, meaning they can't be found anywhere else in the world. Others like humpback whales come here in the winter months to enjoy the warm waters, 
have their babies, and then mate before they migrate up to Alaska. Spinner dolphins can be seen here year-round and are a huge part of the dive tourism industry. Who doesn't want to swim with one of these wild dolphins? Turtles are another iconic animal of these islands and they play a vital role in the Hawaiian culture and religion. Unfortunately, humans are having a dramatic effect on their well-being. Whales, dolphins, seals, and turtles are getting entangled in active and abandoned fishing gear. Some of this gear is put in the water by commercial fishermen, but some of it is also left behind by recreational fishermen. Just about anywhere you go on these islands, you will see fishermen casting their lines from shore, hoping to hook a big one. Sometimes that big one may be a dolphin, a manta ray, or a turtle. They don't intentionally hook these animals, but when they cast their lines, there is no telling who is underwater when the hook drops down. And when the hooks reach the bottom, they can become caught on a coral head or a rock. The fishermen then cut their lines and leave it behind because they have no way to retrieve it. Ocean Defenders has partnered with several dive shops on these islands. One of them, Island Divers Hawaii, lets us charter their boat once a month when we take our volunteer divers out to local dive spots and drop down to remove as much of this ghost gear as we can in one dive. The dives can last up to one hour, and we have pulled up hundreds of pounds of lead weights the fishermen use, as well as tens of thousands of feet of fishing lines. Here's a case where a dolphin had a fishing hook embedded in her flesh, right under her pectoral fin. It would be like you or I getting a hook stuck under our armpit. You can imagine how painful that would be every time you moved your arm. Dolphins obviously use their fins to swim, so they are severely impacted by these hooks. This diver eventually got the hook out because the dolphin was cooperating. Really amazing behavior. She has been seen by this diver many times since this incident and is doing just fine. Here we have a huge manta ray that had a hook and line wrapped around her massive wing and if left unattended would have eventually cut off half her fin, no doubt killing the animal. And as you can see it only takes a few feet of this fishing line to cause a lot of damage. Turtles come in contact with these lines even more frequently because they swim close to shore where they feed on the algae and corals. Some of them have become so entangled that they can hardly move. This one had her flipper completely severed, and with the line wrapped around her neck, she slowly starved to death. Corals are also affected by these lines, as they come in direct contact with them and leach the plastic's toxins into their bodies as it slowly degrades over time. How much time does it take for plastics to break down? Scientists say 450 years for a polypropylene line and 650 years for a nylon net. I hope you now are realizing how devastating this fishing gear can be on our native wildlife. It not only impacts their well-being, but it also affects the local economy. Tourists that see marine debris during their snorkeling or dive encounters are far less likely to visit again and will take their money elsewhere on their next vacation. So removing this debris has a direct impact on the health of the ecosystem as well as on the tourism industry that allows the island economy to thrive. We're all thankful to all the volunteers and dive shops that have helped us remove this ghost gear, both on Oahu and on the big island of Hawaii. But it's not cheap chartering these dive boats and supplying all the gear necessary to facilitate the debris removal. We need volunteers. We also need the financial support of the community. I hope you will consider making a donation to ODA Hawaii. As you can see from this video, we have already accomplished a lot, but with your donation, we could get a whole lot more done. Mahalo. Okay, so one of the other issues that goes on in, in Hawaii is uh, the aquarium fish trade. Uh, this is what a healthy kelp uh, coral uh, colony will look like. This was uh, Fiji. 
Um, you can see the fish are just in a massive abundance within the first 10 feet of the corals because that, that's how far they can uh, be before they have to dive into the corals for, to avoid predators. This is Hawaii today. Where's the fish? Where are the fish? They're all in, a, in your doctor's offices or in your, your uncle's uh, aquariums. Uh, the, the aquarium trade there had no limits up until about a year ago. They finally put limits on it, but uh, they could collect what they wanted, however much they wanted. So that, I'm glad to see that that came to a stop, but uh, it's gonna take decades for that, those reefs to recover uh, to, to the abundance that they once were. Uh, the longline fishery there, uh, pro people probably aren't even aware of this, but uh, right in downtown Honolulu, there's a massive uh, um, longline fishery. Each one of those represents a hook, each one of those uh, silver uh, devices. And they will deploy these lines 60 to 70 miles long. And every uh, 30 feet, 40 feet will be a hook and there's actually trailers off at every 30, 40 feet with multiple hooks on those. So they're catching everything, turtles, um, you know, their targeted species, which are, are the tuna, but they'll catch swordfish, sharks, turtles, all kinds of animals on there. And they just throw them back overboard as bycatch and they don't even count that as what they, they caught. And when every time I go there to Honolulu, I film this because I'm so appalled by it, but. Uh, there's roughly 70 boats there every time I go there, and that just represents what's in the harbor at that moment. There's probably another 100 some odd boats out at, at sea at that time. I filmed this uh, last year. Uh, they were offloading these things. Uh, the, these guys were so small that they probably hadn't even uh, uh, effectively um, propagated. Uh, they were so young that they uh, were in the neighborhood of about 40 pounds, and typically they'd be in the 200 to 500 pound range. I think 400 pounds is the max. But uh, these guys were all babies, so they weren't reproducing. And this is what we're allowing to go on. So uh, I, these are yellowfin tuna. Now there's a big one. That one probably weighed about 80 pounds. But that was the biggest one that I saw during my entire day there. All of them were in that 40 pound range. And again, the, some of these boats uh, have double uh, the amount of lines on it, where it's 70 miles long. Sometimes they'll have 140 miles long in case one uh, line gets damaged, they have a backup. And the, the, the fleet is huge. It just drives me crazy. Um, but anyway, I started working with some of the dive shops uh, on the big island. I started out on Oahu first, but now we've, we've got a reputation started working on the big island, uh, started with Jack's diving locker. And uh, rather than go out into the ocean there because it drops off really deep, I'm talking 3,000, 4,000 feet within a half a mile ashore, uh, we started to cleaning up the, the harbor there. There's a lot of debris in there. Um, it's you know not fun diving by any means, but it's still a, a habitat for animals. We've seen uh, tiger sharks in there turtles all the time. Uh, this is just, you know, uh, we took over the, the area as part of a harbor, but the animals still come in there. So it's important to get this stuff out. And here's an 8D battery uh, that people just throw over the side. Uh, in one of the our cleanups, we got eight of them out of just a one and a half hour dive. And you can imagine the, the uh, acid that's leaking in there, what, uh, you know, what damage that's causing. We find a lot of tires in these harbors uh, because they use them as fenders there rather than use a proper fender. Uh, they, it's cheaper for them to use these tires. And when the tire, the line that attaches the tire to the dock gets worn out, it just falls into the water and they leave it there. Um, we've removed, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's uh, in the neighborhood of 300 tires out of Hanukkahau Harbor. We've done, I think it's eight cleanups there. Uh, we've circumnavigated the, the whole harbor at this point and now are going, we just went back uh, about four months ago and started where we had left, uh, where we had started. We went back for the first time and that had been three years and we still got 67 tires out of there. 
there. So it's reinfecting it. That's that's my point. Uh, this is um, the east side of Oahu. Uh, in fact, that's, I just got back from there uh, Monday. Um, th there's a, a proliferation of tires there. We got we've done eight cleanups at, at this park. This is called Haia Pier, and uh, we one time. On a two-hour dive, we got 110 tires out of there. We went back the next time and got 67 tires. And when I just got back from, like I say, on Monday, on Sunday, we had removed uh, 48 tires. And that totaled uh, 4,200 pounds worth of stuff. And this is what the, the, uh, the tires look down there. They look benign. You know, it's kind of covered in mud and... Uh, you know, it doesn't look like it's harming anything, but these things are made out of uh, from about a thousand different chemicals going to make one tire. So all those chemicals are leaching into the water over time, and we don't even know the damage that it's causing. But I can tell you, I don't feel it's going to do any good to these animals. This is what that area looks like. The, the, the coral could be healthy if we'd allow it, but look at all that fishing line. Uh, and, and again, this is Haia Pier. This is right next to a major um, harbor for boaters. And they're running through this place all the time. So they're stirring up the bottom, and the bottom is, you know, obviously depositing all that uh, debris onto the corals. And you can't really do anything about that, but we can do something about all these lines that are being left behind. Uh, these tires are not easy to get out of there. Look, look at this thing. This had to weigh 500 pounds. Uh, it, it took us well over half an hour to get that thing out of the water. And this is all by hand. You know, this isn't, we don't have mechanical means or, you know, hoist or anything to get that thing out. So anyway, that's that island. Um, one of the other things I do is I go up and down the coast, usually in October. Uh, there's a, a company called, a nonprofit called Lighthawk who uh, uses um, volunteer pilots to take uh, nonprofits and scientists up in the air to look at what we need to uh, inform ourselves and our donors about what we're seeing out there. In my case, I'm looking for uh, uh, commercial lobster traps. I want to find out where are the high concentrations of these things are, so I'll know at the end of the season where to go back, because these guys lose between 10 and 15 percent of their traps every year. So just for instance, here's what we're, we flew over at Point Loma, and I went back the, the next day, and in my Zodiac, I went back and GPS marked every uh, trap I came across. And you saw there, there were 400 traps I saw in one, one day, and another day there were about 480 traps. And this is what happens when these traps are left behind. Um, these were abandoned traps. This isn't one that the fishermen were going to pull, but there were, I don't, I don't remember exactly the number, but I think there were like 50 or 60 lobsters in these two traps. And they were going to die in there. And there were other animals in there as well. So we went back uh, to the boat, got our bolt cutters, and uh, went down there and set them all free. That, that was a fun day. Um, 2022, okay, I just started uh, last year a new partnership with another dive company on Kona called Kona Honu Divers. And this is a really interesting group of people. These are highly skilled underwater photographers as well as uh, dive masters and, and dive instructors. And boy, are these people into it. Um, it, it really kind of is showing the... Um, the grab uh, that the ODA is having on the professionals in the industry, they are seeing the damage that's being done and they want to do something about that. Usually the people that are being paid, they, they want to be paid to do this stuff. You know, when they're making money, they don't want to take time out of their day to go out there and save the environment, but they, these people do. So uh, this guy, Bo, um, I forget his last name, Bo Pardo. Uh, he's a National Geographic photographer. He's been going out with us now for, I believe, it's two years. And he's coming away with some great underwater shots. It's something we've never had. We've all been activists. and that, that Our focus is to clean up, not to take pictures. But it's nice to see that we're uh, getting, um, uh, you know, help from the, the underwater uh, videographers and photographers to, to better tell our story. Because as you guys know, these images... 
resonate a lot more than me sitting here talking about this stuff. So that's why it's important for us to get the, the quality shots under there. And then just last year, we started working with a, a dive shop uh, on Maui, uh, and we've been work removing a bunch of gear there. Um, just to give you an example, and we've done probably 20 dives with these guys. Um, we removed 349 pounds, 349 pounds of lead weight. You know those little lead weights, those little sinkers that these fishermen use, they weigh eight ounces, half a pound. We got 349 pounds of that on a two hour dive. And some places are just infested with this stuff. The, the uh, Hawaiians don't have, uh, or aren't required to have fishing licenses, so they don't learn about this stuff. So anybody and their grandma can go out there and, and fish for these things and they don't understand the damage that they're doing. So that's my job is get these images out there, get them into the, the public consciousness, which is tricky because I'm not Hawaiian and they, you know, they have their uh, cultural uh, issues with uh, uh, white people. Uh, but you, you ha I still have to tackle the, the problem, and, and I'm not going to be put off by them being put off on me. <laughs> I'm there to protect the animals, <laughs> and this is what I have to get across to them. And for the most part, it's working. Um, 2022, I started collaborating with a bunch of students out of uh, UCSB, Santa Barbara, and uh, these, they have a really good marine biology uh, department there, and it's linked to a... Um, uh, finance uh, business, kind of finance business uh, group called the Bren Group. So they, excuse me, uh, they're helping me put together a pitch that I can make about the economic damage that is done here by this stuff. Um, oh, here we go again with music. It's okay. It's okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, that's not bad. <laughs> um, so th th they're helping me put together a, a, an economic picture to, to uh, portray to the fishermen. This is what you're losing. You know, it's not that you're uh, just the point that you're losing your traps. It's the damage that's being done. How many lobsters are killed? How many uh, cormorants are killed? Because cormorants dive down and, and swim into these things quite frequently, we find them. Uh, so it's been really helpful, and we'll soon have up on our website a, uh, a more comprehensive uh, database there where you can go back and read about the economic damage that is caused by this stuff. Uh, one of the uh, things that is probably pertinent to, to you guys up here is the Dungeness crab fishery. You know, they, they have been catching the most amount of whales, entangling the most amount of whales for years now. and. Again, this is a, um, it brings, the Dungeness Crab Fishery brings in $64 million into the local economy every year. But because they're catching so many whales, for the last three years in a row, they've had to shut it down. No fishing. And that's because that water, that vertical line is in the water. We want to eliminate that, that uh, vertical line. So I've been working with uh, three nonprofit, uh, other nonprofit groups to help develop and get into the fishermen's hands what's called pop-up gear. It's uh, the trap is on the bottom. There's the, the buoy line is wrapped up on it. Uh, so it's attached to the trap. The fisherman comes along with a kind of fob thing that they trigger. And now the, the, the buoy goes to the surface and that vertical line is only in the water for 10 minutes rather than 24 hours. Now you can imagine it's cost a lot of money, yeah. Technology, why does it change, has always cost money, especially in the initial phases of it. But if you value the life of a whale, you will understand the impact that this, this pop-up gear can have, and hopefully you understand that it's gonna cost us more money to, to catch these uh, Dungeness crab, but it's the way of the future. So anyway, that's my talk. Thanks for listening. We have water up there for you. We thought I had. We're a step ahead. Not done yet. Wonderful, <laughs> Kurt. Holy moly. Thank goodness for you and your folks.
So Kurt, um, we've seen all this abandoned gear. Um, who are the biggest offenders? Well, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to name individuals, but it is definitely. Diego, is this on? It's just Kate. Yes, it's, it's on. on. It's on. Um, no, it's not. No. Mine is on that? Right, correct. Mine's on. I don't know. Where there you got it. Oh, you got okay. it. Well okay. done. Um, the biggest offender, uh, obviously, commercial fishing industry, but also uh, right behind that is the recreational fishery. Um, as an example, uh, over in Hawaii, I said that they don't even have to have licenses to fish there. So they've uh, used these leaders that they throw out because it's so close, or the deep water is so close to shore, they, they throw their lines out there pretty far, and those lines get caught up on, on the, the uh, uh, corals. And in one dive <coughs> we did there, going back about three weeks ago, <coughs> excuse me, four weeks ago, um, we removed 20,000 feet, four miles of fishing line in, in a two hour dive. So um, it, it, I, I can't say that you know the commercial guys are doing that, that these are recreational guys, but I, I don't follow the, the commercial fishing fleet, like the long line fleet, I don't follow them around. I can't go you know, out into the middle of the ocean to find that stuff, but um, we're dropping uh, roughly 360,000 tons of abandoned <laughs> fishing gear into the water every year. So should we abandon some kinds of fishing gear? In my opinion, yeah. I mean, should we outlaw some kinds of fishing gear? There's a variety of uh, alternatives. Um, the gill netting, for instance, okay, that, that we should outlaw that. Most states in the United States have outlawed gill netting, but in California we haven't. We're, we're I'm on a, a, a series of uh, uh, panels with other organizations where we're trying to get that enacted and we just got in front of the Department of Fish and Wildlife about two months ago and they're in uh, we're in debates on if we can get rid of that but yeah th there are certain uh, fisheries that are way more destructive than others you know obviously if you're going to catch go for a tuna on a, on a line you know a hook and line that's way safer than going down there with a net and catching them because of the bycatch rate. Are the abusing fishermen from certain nations? What nations are the most uh, have the most offenders? Yeah, it's it's the statistics uh, aren't kind to the uh, the Chinese. The, the Chinese China and Taiwan are the biggest offenders when you look at the. Uh, what's called I illegal, unregulated, and undocumented fisheries. Um, those are the two giants of, of that world, and um, it, it's sad what they're doing. But you know, you asked me a question, and that's the reality. So, what type of gear is it? Big long nets that are doing the net gross. I mean, the gross most damage. It, it's a combination of both. Um, let me think here. I had some statistics in my head, but one I can remember, uh, the long lines, which I was talking about, yeah. uh, we put enough of that in the ocean every day to go around the planet 50 times oh. every day. This is the long lines. They're trolled by fishermen, and they've got multiple hundreds of hooks on them. Correct. Thousands, and so yeah. if, if you could outlaw one or the other, would it be the long lines or the nets? Uh, wow. Can I get both? Can I get both? Yeah, I was going to say, this is, which is worse? Yeah, I, I, I don't know where to go with that. Other speakers we've had have told us how bad it is to have these giant nets out there, but then they also tell us that the giant lines are also damaging because they also damage big big mammals. Uh, right. And the big giant nets get uh, <coughs> they damage, but they don't damage the big mammals quite as much. 
they don't, but you know, the, the challenge there is who's taking into account the benthic life after that net drops to the certain down to the bottom. What was that term you used? The benthic. benthic that, that's all the animals that grow on the bottom, the corals, the the fish that live down there, anemones, all kinds of. It's the the foundation of life happens in the benthos, and uh, who counts that? You know, if you're just going to say, uh, as it is it damaging as it relates to humanity, you know, in, in our ability to eat fish. Well, yeah, then then the long line which would be the one you want to go after, but. The benthos, like I say, is where life begins, and we really need to protect that. So in the 40s and 50s, people would throw junk out of their cars. Mm -hmm. And we decided, you know, don't litter, and we became, made it a law. If you threw a cigarette pack out of a car, you know, you could uh, get a ticket. Uh, right now, if somebody throws a piece of fishing gear in the water in the, in the bay, is that a ticketable offense? Is it against the law yet? No. Not, not that I'm aware of. Uh, I, I haven't, you know, you can't throw, uh, you know, an abandoned net in there. If they see you doing that, yeah, then the, they will probably fine you. But uh, something small like that, that's uh, so insignificant to their overall um, scope of, of enforcement. So the question I have is, is there, what regulation would you put in place to diminish the amount of abandoned fishing gear? What would be best? Well... My take on it is, and this is going to go against the, uh, the people are, that are looking at the bottom line. We used to fish using hemp products, cotton or hemp. Mm -hmm. And that stuff deteriorated within two years. You know, and now we've got these lines, the nets and lines that are going to last 650 years. And you're only using it for a very short time. So the solution, if we want to go this way, is to get back to something that's more sustainable, and that's getting back to the hemp. Uh, I remember go back when I was, you know, back in the 70s traveling around, I would go to uh, Spain and Italy, and you'd see all these women working on the nets after the guys came home. So there was a, a, a secondary economy right there. And now with these plastic lines, they're not working on these nets. So all those women are out of jobs and that these nets are floating all over the place. So what potential solution you're proposing is a line that deteriorates or fishing gear which deteriorates more rapidly over time. So even if it is abandoned, it's not as much, uh, as much danger. Correct. Now we've had multiple people come and speak to us who are in your kind of line of work, thank God. Uh, how many organizations are you aware of that are helping to diminish the amount of junk in our Oceans. Uh, it's it, it's not a uh, a lot because it it's not um, it's hard to raise money uh, on this. If you, if you're saving whales and dolphins, that's one thing, and, and that's that's the icon. And I, I was involved with Sea Shepherd for 19 years, and that was our go-to animal. So we we did a, a nice job of raising money through that. But uh, cleaning up the oceans is a thankless job. Um, and, and you've got, not only is it thankless, I, I've had reporters actually go out with us and say that they won't cover our story because it's too depressing. The, it, it turns off their viewers. Okay, well, well I'm sorry, but that's the path I chose. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend what I do to anybody. <laughs> Icebergs are mostly underwater, just a little bit of them is above the water. Yeah. I've been seeing in your videos and researching you as a speaker that um, you're underwater quite a bit. You're a diver automatically, but what percent of the gear that's abandoned is floating a little bit above the water versus under totally underwater? Um, usually they have weights on it, so it's, it's normally sunk. Once it's uh, once it's out of use, they have floats on it to keep it vertical in the, in the water column. Mm -hmm. But those floats uh, deteriorate over time, so they slowly drop down onto the bottom. I, I don't know the duration of how long that takes, but you know it does take some time. Now, is Ocean Defenders a five hundred one c three? Yeah. So, if people wanted to contribute to you, just give us the URL. Where would they go? Uh, our website, oceandefenders.org, and there's uh, pull-down menus to donate there. Okay. I've also got a sign-up sheet back there on that table if anybody wants to sign up for our, our uh, website. And, mm -hmm. uh, we, you, you can unsubscribe real easily. I realize everybody gets too many emails, but 
um, that, that you know that would help us out is if you sign up and that way you can keep up to date with what we're doing so now little GPS trackers on nets that's a potential solution talk a little bit about that yeah they, they've been working with that the, the challenge with the GPS trackers there, there's a couple of them is battery life you know how long they're gonna last as well as range and it, once the GPS tracker drops into the water column, well, it doesn't send a signal, so it only works when it's at the surface. So it, it, it's a you know a feel good story, but um, it, it, in practicality, I don't know that that's the way to go. But I, I think if I can expand on that, if you're getting at being responsible for these nets, the, I think the fishermen should there should be a database by the Department of Fish and Wildlife or whoever the governing authority is. is okay, you, we know what you had at the beginning of the season. You tell us where you lost it, what you did with it at the end of the year, and if you can tell organizations like mine, hey, I lost it here, you know, back then, we'll go get it. I, I'm not out to, to find these people or put them in financial binds. We just want them out <laughs> of the water. Do you have any um, metrics on the measure of economic damage done by men in gear? You know, we, the, the, these students, I, I'm not a scientist, by any stretch of the imagination. So I, I've had those students, they interned with us for, for a year. So they, they're still working on the dynamics of that. So it's still uh, being developed. So other speakers have talked about the amount of effluent or junk that comes down in rivers, especially out of India and Southeast Asia and so on. Uh, what's being done in America to keep junk from flowing from rivers into our oceans? Uh, there's been some really cool success stories. I'm glad you asked that question because as you see the stuff coming down the rivers and things, you, you're thinking, why doesn't somebody do something about that? There's this thing, a device called the uh, uh, Water Wheel? Yeah, Mr. Water Wheel. Uh, the first one was implemented in uh, Baltimore. And what it is, it's, it's using the um, old uh, technology of the water wheel, the grist mills that they were using, you know, they had that paddle wheel in the middle of the, the river and it was the, the force of the river would rotate the thing and the shaft was attached to some device that would crush the grain. So now what they're doing, this uh, Mr. Trash Wheel is what it's called, uh, it the, uh, collects the debris, there's funnels or uh, uh, diverters on the side of the river the uh, device itself uh, is put in the middle of the river, and then there's diverters on the side of the river that uh, funnel the, all the debris to this wheel. This wheel picks it up, uh, there's scoops on, uh, you know, every three or four feet on the wheel. It picks it up and then dumps it into the back, in, which has a, a trash collector in there. And it's obviously water driven, and then there's solar panels on it that, that drive uh, some of the uh, water uh, uh, portions of it, some of the forces you need. And then they also have a computer on there that says, okay, my bin is filled, somebody needs to come and take it out. And that can be done, uh, when I looked into it, it was costing about a million dollars to uh, in, install one of those devices. So they did that in um, uh, Baltimore, that was their uh, first one. They, they put one in uh, Paris, France, I don't know what river. And now um, they put another one in um, Laguna Beach, or excuse me, Newport Beach, the back bay, they're putting another one in there. And that's very effective. It, it can get anything from uh, a cigarette butt to a tire. So it's really, really well done. So now I heard there was an experiment with the Los Angeles River as well. They were trying to filter junk coming out down. Can you talk about that? Yeah, that, that hasn't been working near as effectively as this Mr. Trash Wheel. Uh, they've got it off to the side of the, uh, the channel of the river. So you still got a bunch of stuff that's flowing past. Uh, it, it, it does a relatively good job, but it doesn't have the, uh, the computer uh, alert system on it. So guys, people have to go there constantly and, and collect the, the debris. You never know when it's filled up is what I'm getting at. And that's what's so different about the Mr. Trash Reel. Now, I'm gonna keep asking questions because it's such a fascinating subject, but if someone has a question in the audience, please put your hand up and we'll bring a mic to you. Perfect, wonderful. 
Tonight. Would the Alameda Estuary be a good place to put one of these things? Oh man, there's all kinds of junk which comes down there. Yeah, I've, wow. I've seen it. Uh, and if, if you can put me in touch with authorities there, I, I am in touch with uh, uh, John Kellett, the guy who invented this, Mr. Trashway. And we've gone through the uh, environmental studies uh, aspect together. So I can put the two together, the city or whatever the municipality is that can uh, do that. Uh, I can put them in touch with this and maybe we can get something going. I can't do it all. <laughs> That's a good suggestion. Thanks. Another question. Have you seen these mountains of stuff you pull out of the water? What happens to that stuff? Yeah, it's, there's, uh, there's no easy solution, especially when you're in Hawaii. They're on an island and they don't have uh, the facilities that mainland has. One of the better things that uh, happens on um, Oahu is they have a, an electric company that uh, burns the tires. So they convert that into electricity. Uh, that's, it's a magical way of thinking that you get rid of it, but we all know there's air pollution that comes from that. But uh, I don't know what you do with tires. They, they are ubiquitous all over the world and they're designed to last a long time and they do last a long time. But uh, that's one solution to it. Other than that, there, there's studies being done and uh, turning type, chopping tires up and converting them into uh, a kind of a slurry to where you can put them on top of roads. So they create a, uh, a, uh, a less, uh, what's the word here? Uh, less abrasive surface. So your tires aren't wearing as much. An average tire will uh, break down uh, nine pounds of plat uh, rubber uh, per year. So your cars are producing a, an awful lot of uh, microplastics every year. But if you're making the roads out of this stuff, it's less abrasive. So I, I don't know the facts of how much less it's abrasive, but it's, it's one solution to it. Uh, as far as the other debris, it all goes to the landfill. It, it, the important thing is to get it out of the marine environment, in my opinion. Now, you're in America and you're doing this. What countries uh, worldwide are doing the best job of diminishing this growing problem of junk in the oceans? You know, I, I, it, there's so many issues going on that I don't know that this is properly being addressed anywhere, in my opinion. Um, I, I, you know, s small mun municipalities are doing what they can, but I don't know of any country that's taking this on as this, this is what we're going to do. I haven't heard of that. So how many days a year are you um, in the water? Well, by in or on the water, I handle the boat most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, in, you mean all my chapters? Yeah. Okay, uh, it, it's at least once a week. And sometimes it's twice a week. Mm -hmm. So 50 something times a year. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> what's your, what's a day in the life of Kurt Lieber and Ocean Defenders like? What's, what, what, what are you spending your time? Trying to get the word out educationally, setting up talk at school? What are you doing? It, it's a combination. Uh, it's working on the damn boat, you know. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. 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 working on the boat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 We can't, we can't. So yeah. I must be doing something wrong if you guys are not agreeing with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. None of us really? most can imagine anything going wrong with the boat. Right? <laughs> you, you fix it once and it's fixed. I, 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 don't, I don't understand this. <laughs> well, I must have bought the wrong boat. <laughs> so, that, no. that, that it takes up an inordinate amount of my time. But, uh, you know, I, I do try to do the best I can to uh, uh, write articles. I write most of the articles. I take most of the pictures, uh, you know, although I'm having people come up and, and step up and do that as well. But, you know, it takes a lot to, to run an organization. You got the finances, you got the insurance. You know, you know, the volunteers, inspiring the volunteers and coming out and talking to people, going out to schools and trying to get them inspired. Uh, I love it all, but, you know, that's what I do. Yeah. So, Kurt, we've had people come and give us all these theoretical models about junk, but you actually have rolled up your sleeves and you're doing God's work. Thank you so much Thank for being here. Thank you.
This has been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.